Okay, dealing with SQL triggers. So our favorite subject uh, with session context, which you may or may not uh, use. Uh, I'm Ryan, I work at 180 Medical. We are a very heavy database business logic shop. Um, I'd say we probably have 95% of it in the database. We have thousands of procs doing anything from shipping orders to billing to managing patient, et cetera. It lives in the database because it needs to be highly available, quick, et cetera. Um, so to start, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know um, before diving into building a trigger. Don't. <laughs> so, right, okay. So like everything, you know, there's a, there's a use for everything. You know, I wish I could stop here, but the problem is, is back in reality, you know, there, there's other considerations. Now, obviously, this is not plan A, you know, so the stuff I'll be talking about here is, it, it's not so much, hey, this is a great way to do it, it is if you're in this situation, you want to limit the damage. Um, now, there is one thing we get out of a trigger, which is it's a gateway, like a bouncer. Every time you touch that table, if you've got an insert, update, or delete, it's going to get called which is really kind of nice because there's not another great mechanism for that. You can say, boy, just put it all in a stored procedure or put it all in one thing, but that doesn't mean, you know, A, that you can trust everybody in the future to do that. You know, you might not even be here. You might say, boy, if I touch this table and I don't go do this thing over here, the whole system will explode. But it's not documented everywhere and some poor person following you doesn't know that. So you just have to put some, you, you know, you hate the trigger, but it's there. So that's pretty much the only good thing for a trigger. You know, a lot of people use them to store audit data just because it's like data goes in, data goes out to your audit table, but it, it doesn't really block or cause a lot of the nasty problems because you're, you know, it's two, two different processes. You know, the bad about a trigger, it acts as a gateway for everything you touch on that table, so you can't avoid it. Um, the bad and the ugly, so performance. There's not anything necessarily bad performance-wise with the trigger, but it's, it's, it's just like a magnet for bad anti-patterns where you're, you're trying to do something and then you've got a second statement going. Um, hidden code. This is probably my biggest pet peeve. If I, you know, I don't like to, as a developer, you're stuck in a lot of spaces where you want to reuse code you know, so you want to put it in a proc or a view or a function or something. It's because we don't want to write the same code six times. But then on the other hand, it's like you don't know what's underneath that. You know, at least if I'm selecting something from a view or a CT or, or something else that I'm not currently staring at, at least I can see myself doing it. You know, a trigger is if you don't know it's there, nothing tells you, you write an update statement and then you see 16 you know, different query, you know, you look at your execution plan, there's 72 queries, like how did that happen? Um, so it's, it's not good because it's just not obvious. Um, transactions with a trigger, you touch the table, it's technically still in the same transaction. Even if it's updating the same table, it's there, and yet it's still, but it releases the process, which puts you in a, in a state where you're almost in a SQL sandwich of transactions because something else can come in, try to, you know, normally when you block a table, which isn't good, but at least you're blocking it, you're in the way, you know, nobody else is touching this table until I'm done. With, a tr with uh, triggers, it just, it just doesn't. It will block, but not really. And so, especially if you have a process that's updating the table repeatedly, um, you're gonna cause deadlocks, which causes it to just literally throw away one of, those, uh, one of those processes, which is scary. Now, if you are updating, if you're using a trigger to update your same table, you know, which is even worse, those deadlocks could be you. Um, so, alternatives before I talk kind of how to mitigate the damage, because the best thing is just not to use it. Um, when possible, put everything in one place. If you have a super secret, you know, hockey, basketball game, get proc, and, and there's a ton of data, just, just get it in one place. Just, just do it. Um, peop, it's pretty obvious to find, you know, the downside there is, again, somebody might not know later and they might build the same code, they might build a report, et cetera. Uh, change data capture um, is pretty neat. It is, it's an older feature, but with SQL 2016, it's standard. So uh, 
we're not using it because we started prior to 2016, but uh, what it essentially does is it works similar to a trigger, but attaches to your SQL log. So as you're writing the log, it fires then. So it, it can allow you to update a table, get into the log, which technically writes before you write to your table, but the way that this attaches, it, it writes kind of at the end. So it gives you that near real time, but I'm not really interfering with my main process. Um, it has a couple of limitations. You can't get the current user because it's pulling it out of the log, uh, but how often do you need to do that in a trigger anyway? Um, you know, I mentioned the same table, so sometimes you update the, let's say you update the units column and you need to go calculate the cost column. This is a terrible idea, like as if tr using a trigger wasn't bad enough, you update a table, then you use the trigger to update the table again. What does that have, what does that cause? What well, calls the trigger again? So you can get into a spot where you hit max recursion, it, you might not even know it because SQL will run 100 times by default and then not tell you and hide it and it's just like, well why does this trigger take so long? Um, so an alternative, if you need something from one column calculated to the same table, you know, maybe rolled up or multiplied, put a function on that column, persisted, because if you don't persist it, it calls the function every time you query the table, which is terrible. But if you persist it, it just calculates when you're running, which isn't too bad. Okay, so here's our trigger workflow, and kind of on the left here, whoo, you can kind of see, this is really what happens currently, you know, out of the box. You do a, tr you do a table update, you got an instead of or you know insert update trigger and it does stuff. Now, you know when I talked initially, you know you described that problem of, yeah, but I really kind of need a trigger, but I don't want all the awful things with the triggers. Maybe you came into a uh, shop where they already existed and there's 16 things updating this table. You know you can't just stop and rewrite the entire data. You know kind of like your example you can't just fix the database. You know, maybe you were, maybe it's your database, but you were really squeezed on time when you wrote it and you just dropped things out. You know, whatever the reason is, um, you wanna be able to fix some of these problems without necessarily doing it all at once or putting yourself in a position where it's like, okay, I, I fixed these 16 workflows, but my goodness, if somebody comes behind me and touches this table, it's gonna all explode. So what the desired workflow is here in this case is you want to be able to actually do your table updates and the other stuff you need to do and be done. But if you don't do that other work, you need to fall back to that trigger. And in my case, what I want to do is I want to log so that I know that that happens. So maybe you log to a log table and then send yourself an email that says, hey, somebody updated my hockey table and they didn't, uh, they didn't do it through the stored procedure like you're supposed to. Um, so, like the title of this talk, we're gonna use session context to do that. If you're not familiar with session context, it's just a little property bag. Um, prior to 2016, it was called context info, which still exists. Um, that's very limited because you can stuff a GUID in it and that's all you can do. And GUIDs aren't very easy to work with, but they're also very unique, so some people like them because you can search for them. Uh, session context, if you're familiar with key value pairs, is just that. It's an NVAR car key, which is the name, and it's a SQL variant, which is the value. So you can stuff a one in there, you can stuff pretty much anything. Um, in my case, I'm just gonna be sticking a one in it. You can kind of see the syntax here, which is, we're gonna set session context, the key is my key, the value is one. So to me, that means I did this thing. So the intended workflow, if going back a step, is when I do the work that I know needs to happen, maybe you're rolling up your invoices, maybe you're uh, writing, you know, maybe you're materializing data, because I hate calculating millions of lines of data, I'd rather calculate them once um, when I'm storing, storing my table value. Um, when we do this, we're going to set our session context that says, hey, I did this specific work. And then down in the trigger, technically it's still here, but in this trigger, we're gonna say, if I have this session context, I know my work is already done, so I'm just gonna leave and not do awful things. Um, which is done just by checking the value of that key 
you know, if my session context equals one, because I know I'm setting it to one. So I created a quick demo. I'll uh, email this out or, or just Slack, send it out on Slack. Um, but just a very simple tech demo. I've got two uh, tables. One, table one, which has an integer test field. And uh, table two has a varchar test field. And so my requirements uh, from the business is when I, when I insert, update, or do anything to table one, I have to print cat out in SQL. Like it just, it can't happen. If, if it didn't happen, you know, you don't, you, I'm not even gonna tell you because you don't wanna know. And table two, we gotta print boot, okay? Has to happen. And so what I don't wanna do is have these things silently firing, so we're gonna walk through this demo. I created uh, a save proc for each of these, and I created a table trigger for each of these, just to kind of demonstrate. Okay, so just walking through this really quickly, in my first uh, store procedure, like I said, I'm going to say, hey, table one save, I've got that. So I'm printing cat, which fulfills my requirement. So the expectation is, is when I hit my trigger, I'm gonna check for that key. I, if I see that I've set it, I assume that I've done the work. Now somebody might have set, set that session key and then not done it, but that's all, you know, I can't help that. Uh, but it gives me something nice that I can search for because if I do look at the trigger, I can look for table one save, that should be pretty unique. Um, and you can see I'm actually setting the key to null and the reason I'm doing that is because what if I update the table twice? So I set it, I update it, then I update it again and I forget to you know, echo cat. So I'm actually clearing it out so that each time the triggers run, I'm you know, responsible for doing it. Um, if I didn't set it, you can see my trigger here prints cat because that's what I want to do, it has to happen. So it's either gonna happen up in my workflow where I want it to happen, or it's gonna fall back um, and happen in my trigger. And in this case, I actually created a, a you know, one last proc which does a log. Um, and I'll show you that in a second on the output. So if I just wanna insert into demo table one, and I say, I'm not sure if you can read it up there, but I'm gonna insert a value 9999, and then I'm gonna select it, this is my output. Um, these top two are actually from my uh, logging trigger. I just, I said, hey, select object name, and then select, uh, it's pretty hacky, which is, I wouldn't really use in production, but what I'm doing is I'm selecting from the input buffer to see what command was called, because when I was looking at this problem, my thought was, well, something could get called, but what if somebody updated, what if another developer updated the database? And I, it's not like I'm tracing this all the time, so I wanna know where this thing came from. But I don't, I can't just use the trigger name because I know the trigger fired, so I wanted to grab what was the, the command they typed in. This is what I found on Google. Um, works pretty well, at least in my testing. I don't know if it would work in production. In production, I would probably just log that this thing is firing. Because the intent is, is that I clean up my code, I get everything out of triggers, but if it's super, super critical, I can still have that trigger behind so that it catches it, does the work, logs it, and by logging it, you know, in, in our world is we dump it into a table, and then some other process comes up and emails us until, you know, we essentially nag ourselves until we fix it. It's like, hey, you're doing this thing, you're doing, you know. Um, on the save, oh, and, and, oh, I forgot to get messages here. Uh, sorry, I'm not brave enough to do a, to do a live demo uh, like some of y'all, but I forgot to grab my output, but I promise uh, in the messages this would have output what I wanted it to. Um, secondarily, I, this time I'm calling my save, which if you'll recall, it actually does my work that I want to do. Uh, so here's my output when I run my proc and then um, do nothing else. Now you notice my trigger didn't fire, it didn't echo out any of that code, uh, but I still, got my, I still got my cat, which makes me happy. Okay, second demo, just very quick, uh, is, is kind of the opposite of that. Say you get to the spot where um, it, everything is clean, but this thing that I have is so critical to my application, I can't ever have it not happen. So what I actually want to do is I want to prevent people from ever doing it outside of the process that I've created for updating this table. And so on this one, we're doing 
something just exactly like the same uh, as the first proc. We're just inserting into the tables. And we're going to do our requirement for that one was to output boot. But in this trigger, I'm going to say, if you don't set a session key, I'm going to roll back anything that's, that's pending. And then I'm going to log it, that it happened. And then I'm going to raise an error, which if you hadn't noticed, uh, Microsoft misspelled. It's been misspelled since like 2000. Um, and if you hadn't noticed yet, now you always will. Uh, it actually, you know, so I wonder if it's like, like some Egyptian programmer was trying to warn people of like, you know, raw is error. <laughs> just, just saying. So this, this trigger actually, do, it doesn't do work. It doesn't create deadlocks. It doesn't cause other things. It just says, you know, stop there, criminal scum. You must call this save proc. You can't just update the, the, the table. And it, act, and it gives you the name of the, of the key. You know, if you got this error, you could search for it. It'd be er very easy to find. So when I try to insert into this uh, table, I get exactly what I'm expecting. It just throws an error, throws up into my, into my SQL, and, and doesn't let me, you know, there's nothing in there. Uh, on the proc, proc works exactly as I was hoping it would, which is I've got this save proc that is the only way to update this table, and it does what I need it to do. And that's it. Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Thank you very much.